Greetings. 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 It is I, your king, King Clifford Jefferson. I sit as a Godfrey, the fifth kind of man, Jews, on the folk rule of Jerusalem, on the reincarnation of King Edgar, the peaceful, better known as King Edgar Jefferson, who we know here at the Third Temple English Church of England as Jesus Christ. I'm here with another, another marvelous lecture from my brothers, and my sisters, the heirs and successors of the English Anglo-Saxon Berbers. Um, uh, it is March 21st, 2024, which is the Berber year 2974. Uh, this lecture here is just uh, to talk about or clear up our understanding about an inheritance or a birthright and who the inheritance or the birthright was supposed to be or who was promised for and who was to initiate the reversion or remanderment of that which was promised under what we call a birthright. And birthrights only denotes to those which are reserved uh, in law based off the law of what we call distribution, statute of distribution or dispensation of the state of, of the estate by what we call operation of law. Operation of law. So we're going to talk about how we move from uh, intel estates, which are reserved for the male heir or the firstborn. Uh, which we know as primogeniture on the agnatic succession versus how uh, the uh, estates are left now by way of what we call alienation, we do what we call last will and testaments, which is nothing more than uh, life estates to what we call fee simple, which is a conversion of the intel estate into uh, what we call fee simple. All right. So we're going to understand these terms, but before we go through that. I want to deal with a, a brother, uh, whoever he is, from the Cornish Temple, I guess the temple uh, that was just created uh, by some member who's associated with, uh, I guess, the more Science Temple of America, but he took it upon himself to make some remarks in regards to me being the representation or the personification in lieu of the incarnation of King Edgar the Peaceful, which we call the King of Peace. So I want to address that real quick. Uh, for him, because truly, uh, the mass of the people are ignorant about what they did, what it is that they're supposed to be knowing, and that's why I was, uh, uh, have I have come to be able to restore that information by going through the information and sifting, uh, uh, do the mess that had been accumulated, and make sure that it's preserved in its integrity based off the premises that was laid down by our ancestors, going back to what we call time and memorial. OK, you cannot have a birthright without the right of being on a land because the birthright denotes to the inheritance which involves the land. OK, that's the birthright because you have no ability to be able to do any type of uh, uh, commercial activity or whatever you call trade commerce if you don't have the right to the land. OK, if you are acting in these capacities, then it's unlawful because you were not given lawful authority to com to actually commit such uh, foreign and domestic uh, uh, transactions uh, based upon the law that were put in force by our ancient ancestors through what we call time and moral, by way we call either by acts of the king or acts of what we call parliament. And when we say parliament, we're specific. We're talking about the English parliament contrary to the Scottish Parliament or the parliaments created by what we call the unification of Great Britain, okay? Or any other parliament for that matter, all right? So without further ado, let me get started. Let me first address the issue with the with whatever the brother's name. Uh, he fails to show his face. I, I don't know who he is. I don't know why he took it upon himself uh, to even make a comment about uh, us here at the Third Team English Church of England. But as a result of that, I must defend the English church. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to play two videos by this brother to show you that uh, he's ignorant about it, what it is that he teach. All right? He's ignorant about what he teach. All right? His platform or school of thought is called the Cornish 
University. We know the Cornish or the Cornish people is a name that associated with people that derived from or came from what we call Cornwall, okay, which is territory territorial over in what we call England, which we know as now called Great Britain. All right. So it's very important we understand and listen to what this 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 guy is saying because in in his statements he's truly ignorant about what it is that he the statements he, he's clearly ignorant about the statements that he made. All right. One minute he called himself a descendant of the Cornish people, and then uh, and then after that he's clearly saying that uh, the foreigners are the Cornish people. All right. So let's just hear it from his mouth. All right. Before I expose. Let's get there. All right. This is called the Cornish Temple. Everybody see that? I want y'all to listen very close to what he's saying, okay? Listen very close to what he's saying. Okay. King Edgar, the peaceful, reincarnated reveal of Clifford Jefferson. Now, we know the word Jefferson means peaceful place or peaceful territory. So we know that it's, it's, it's a is a is a is a metonym denoting to uh, 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 something associated with the qualities of this individual known as King Edgar. All right, we know a surname didn't arrive till after the Norman Conquest. All right, so we know that if his name was King Edgar the Peaceful, or we refer to as King Edgar the Peaceful, and we know that the word Jefferson or Godfrey, or Godfrey is a name that means peaceful place, and I can only associate it with that name, because if I was a king, then I wouldn't want the place or the territory that I'm ruling to be peaceful, all right? And I'm going to show you that because of the certain name, which is a patronymic name, that, and as a result of is uh, uh, what we call a promogeniture, that I have a right to be able to take on the right of an inheritance on behalf of the estate that was exceeded as a result of interstate, all right? Because nobody has done that uh, since time immemorial, going back to the origin of where my surname, Jefferson or Godfrey, descended down from. I'm not going to go through that today because I've done that in previous lectures, but we're just going to go through the lecture and just deal with the presumptions Claim or presumptuous claims made by the individual who made this particular video. Okay, so let's get started. demonstration in regards to the brother saying that he was the reincarnated King Edgar the Peaceful. Now this brother used to be a member of the Moorish Science Temple with the Grand Sheik Nature El Bay and I noticed that he left the temple 
and began demonstrating in regards to the crown in England. But now I see that he's claiming to be the reincarnated King Edgar the Peaceful. So now I understand why he did this, because he is trying to be ahead. So we'll read through about King Edgar the Peaceful. In the days of King Edgar, the people believed the earth was flat. They were densely ignorant as compared with the people of today. There are no people on earth today unless it be in the densest jungles or in the Arctic region as ignorant as were the people of King Edgar's day. And ignorance always begets intolerance. The more ignorant a person is, the more determined he or she becomes to dictate to others and make others do as he or she deems best. In the days of King Edgar the Peaceful, men were beheaded for disobeying religious orders of the king. During the reign of King Edgar the Peaceful, it says Edward, but that's a misprint. Beginning in 958, almost a thousand years ago, it was unlawful to sell even a loaf of bread on the Sabbath day. If one sang a song other than a religious hymn, sanctioned by the crown, one was liable to severe punishment. If one danced on the Sabbath or had any enjoyment other than that prescribed by the king, one was subject for the stocks, the jail, or some other form of severe punishment. King Edgar the Peaceful, as his name and title indicate, was a pious man and regarded himself as the guardian, not only of the morals of himself, but of all his subjects. He was his brother's keeper and was determined that his brother should not go to hell unless he had some punishment on the earth first. So I ask all the European English, is this who you want to be a subject to? The reincarnated King Edgar, the peaceful? That's far from peaceful. If you study at the Cornish Temple, you'll always hear, we are who our ancestors were today without doubt or contradiction. And this is exactly what happened in the past in regards to Moors becoming what is called Moriscos, where they was first Moslems and Moors, but then they went to be Christian Moors and help fight against their own brothers, and at the same time, putting the Celtic brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, into bondage and forcing them to do what they say to feed their own ego. So I hope this brother returns back to Islamism. His prophet is Noble Drew Ali, and this is what he used to study in the beginning. But somewhere he went off on his path, and now he wishes to be a Christian more, which is not who his ancestors was. His ancestors was Muslims, and they practiced the old-time religion of Islamism. So again, I hope the brother returns back to his ancient ancestors' ways and finds peace within himself. Because him saying he's the reincarnated Edgar the Peaceful, you see what he's going to wish to do. And if he was ever put in control, he would end up doing what they said Edgar the Peaceful is doing. Because he claims that he is the reincarnated. So maybe he is, or maybe he isn't. I'll let you decide, brothers and sisters. I'll leave you in peace and love. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, this brother is funny because apparently he doesn't know who King Edgar is, he probably just watched the video, but have no understanding about who this king was, who his ancestors was, who were, who, who, what, what type of laws he had in place, what was the purpose of the tent of his laws. He has, has no clue. All right. He hasn't given one source. He read from a book. We, we can tell that whoever wrote the book didn't know what he's talking about because he spelled the name wrong. Right. He claimed it was a clerical error, but the whole uh, 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 terminology of how he's trying to uh, display uh, the the integrity of King Edgar the Peaceful is clearly wrong because you just read within that book that he said King Edgar was a pious man and that he was his brother's keeper. And I agree that if you're not living up to the righteous, then you should be punished. You should be held accountable for what you... Now, I'm not going to let you just lie because you're my family member. No, wrong is wrong. All right. If you're going, if you're going to deal with it from uh, uh, a positive and negative, or right and wrong, truth and falsehood, then you must get, serve two masters. All right. So let's get into the statements because first of all, he said he's from the Cornish Temple. Okay. 
the Cornish Temple, but he is associating the Cornish Temple with the Morris Science Temple of America because the language he's using is of the Morris Science Temple of America. Okay. First of all, and we know Cornish people are associated with the territory of England called Cornwall. All right. Do you have any idea about the territory called Cornwall or who were the people of the progen progenitors of the territory called Conrad? We ain't talking about folklore or myth. We're talking about the historical laws that validate the existence of the territory and the people that we call Cornwall, because clearly you don't know who you are. All right. You're saying that you're a Morris American because you're repping Morris American. You're mad at me because I'm not a Morris American. You're mad at me because I'm not following Nobel Jolly. I had to first go to that class and that school of thought to get an understanding that that thought of, school, of schooling was wrong. All right? You have yet to come to that crossroad, my brother. All right? So let's prove to you that the very people you were talking about as you read in that book, that were incompetent at the time of King Edward the Peaceful until this present day, you are the very one that you're talking about. Why? Let's prove it. Matter of fact, I got another video for you first. All right, because you see, he's called the Cornish Temple. All right. The Cornish Temple. Let's watch this one now. Real, real short one. It ain't too long. Now he's called the Cornish Temple. Now watch what he say about the immigrants of the of the people who of of course the Cornish but descent. Not American. Okay. Just because you're born in a listen, y'all. Listen, listen to this ignorant fool. First proposed coat of arms of the United States, designed by Pierre Eugene. So immediately surrounding the shield, you see the 13 colonies. But let's go into the symbolism. At the top, you see a rose, which is referencing the War of Roses in regards to England. Next to it, you see the thistle, which is meaning Scotland. Then you have the harp, which is for Ireland. And we know that the harp is played while the boar's head is brought in, symbolizing the celebration of cutting off the moor's head. Next to that, you see the flower de luce for France. And we know the French had the French protectorate when colonizing the Moorish Empire. Then you have the imperial eagle saber for Germany or Austria. And the sixth, the Belgic lion for Holland. The double-headed eagle is also with the Scottish Rite, but the faces are facing east and west and it has one body. And that is symbolizing, again, the Moorish Empire reaching from east all the way across the Great Atlantic Ocean and to the west. It is of Hittite origin. And the Moors are the bloodline of the Canaanites, Moabites, and Hittites. On the left, you see the mother holding up a <coughs> stick, and it has the Moorish fez hanging from it, also known as the Liberty Cap of Freedom, which the abolitionists wore. But they tell you the abolitionists was trying to free the slaves, but in fact, they was of the bloodline of the Moors trying to free their brothers. So these symbols are pointing out the countries from which these states have been peopled. But none of them are from America. But their children today will jump up and down and swear to the death that they're American. But they're not American. Just because you're born in America, it don't make you American. If I'm born in Japan and I walk around talking about I'm Japanese, they will see me as crazy because I'm not honoring my bloodline. You're not honoring Austria, Germany, Ireland, Scotland, England. You're throwing away your ancestors' bloodline to call yourself what? White and say you're American. But again, if you're born and raised in Japan, running around pale-skinned European, talking about you're Japanese, you're going to be seen as crazy. So the nations of the world look at all of you that are in America calling yourself Americans crazy. The true definition of American is 
the various copper tone peoples found on the continent by the Europeans. To this day, the United States banner still identifies those stripes as colonies, and colonies are colonial. It's colonial period, which means colonizing through slavery, through murder and theft. And you still identify and honor those terms that delude to slavery, including white. Because if you're claiming you're white, there's an inferior race, which they call black. That's the problem with America. They're the only ones who call themselves colors. The true possessors of America and over the Atlantic Ocean, where what they call Morocco, are the Moors because they're bound to the land by heritage. They wasn't all brought to the Americas by slavery. They was found here by the Europeans already. The ones today that is misnomered as black and the ones that are called Indians. When Christopher Columbus came to these lands, he seen that the people was dressed like the Muslims in the East. Indians come from India. So you can't say that the ones that are calling themselves Native Americans who call themselves Indians are from America. Because again, Indians come from India which is really Hindustan. India started from the East India Company. So it's really a British company. Besides, we have the manuscripts where Indians had to register with the Methodist Church and all of the Moorish schools were turned into Indian schools. So I just wanted to do a decoding of this image. And now you see why they didn't use it. Because if they did, we would always look and know that our ancestors came from a different land. And nowadays they call themselves white, talking about illegal immigrants and all that, when their ancestors was indeed immigrants, coming off of Ellis Island boats with nothing but a picnic basket. But now you got nerve enough to tell people that was always been in America that they can't cross a line. Well, what are you going to do one day when people in North Carolina starts telling people in South Carolina that they can't cross their border and come to North Carolina? It's the same thing, just like what they call Canada, which is really Canaan land. That's North America. Just because they put an imaginary boundary through a line, you think that it's a totally different country. It's one continent. Everybody's American, all the way down to South, Central, North America. It's all America. So how dare you call these people immigrants on their own land that you're standing on and their ancestors was here way before yours. That's why they're flooding in because they know that what you're saying is BS. The man that recognized so-called Texas's sovereignty was a French man named Guizant during the Louisiana Purchase that was sold to Thomas Jefferson through illegal colonization, which the Moors took the U.S. to court and won back all that land. Stop but lying. I have it to this day because it's still being colonized. I suggest you take a trip to the Library of Congress and you sit in there and you study for a year. The manuscripts I found said that everyone in Texas today are really of French nationality. But that's across the ocean. That's not American. So how are you going to be a sovereign state when your descendants are of French nationality? But telling people that they can't come to that territory when their ancestors was here before you. You see what I mean? That's why they're doing what they're doing. So how dare pale-skinned Europeans tell these people they can't come across that imaginary line when all the continent is together? Again, it's like telling you you can't go north which is in line with what we was demonstrating in the temple today in regards to United States. Joe Biden named his son Bew. When you look up Bew, the etymology is French. When you look up Joe Biden's secretary, it's Pierre. She's French because now North America is under French protectorate. That's why they use the white identification so they can be ambiguous and you don't have to really think about your bloodline because if you did, you'd realize that you're not home. Your home is across over in Cornwall, Austria, Hallstatt, Russia, Germany, and all that. I Did y'all hear that? Last, brothers and sisters. Don't you want that? Your home is across over in Cornwall, Austria, Hallstatt, Russia, Germany, and all that. I Let's repeat best, that one last, more time. You'd realize that you're not home. Your home is across over in Cornwall, Austria, Hallstatt. Russia, Germany, and all that. Okay. All right. So he said, Cornwall. Cornish people come from Cornwall. And you are called, or your organization, or your society, or your platform is called the Cornish Temple. We are called the English, third-tipping English Church of England. We know that the, the, the nations who 
made of what we call North America goes back to the creation of the great sail of the United States, right? With the original people who were already here and those who migrated here. We know that England and France was already here when you're dealing with the history of uh, New France and New Spain, okay? Or, uh, yeah, New France and New Spain, all right? That's connected to our story, all right? That's not connected to the more the, the more story here on this continent, all right? That needs to be made clear. But for the sake of the argument, let's deal with your argument. Since you claim to be a most American, which I don't see no no um no heraldic library badge on this on this particular crest. Not at all. Which one do you represent? All right. Which one? All right. If the, if if you don't have a right to be up here, then where is your right? Where is your proof of a right? that these lands belong to Moors. Where was the king when the letter patent was given for feudal kings on these lands to the people who now hold the estate on these lands? Because you said that the Moors got their land back, but now it was subject to what, what they said, um, uh, whatever you said, you said that, that it's, it's, it's still being subject to the tyranny. Let's just read that again. identification so they can be ambiguous and you don't have to really think about your bloodline because if you did you'd realize that you're not home your home is across over in cornwall austria hallstatt russia germany and all that i left the best for last brothers and sisters okay as we know thomas jefferson gave his oath upon a Quran, <coughs> and that is the eye of allah the triangle is representative of the trinity or triune principle, the harmonies of life. Okay. All right. All that other stuff you're talking about is a bunch of crap. All right. Let's get to it. You are called the Cornish Temple. Sorry. Cornish Temple. All right. 78 videos, 36 subscribers. All right. We are the third Temple English Church of England. All right. That's who we are. We are the third temple church of England. We have 248 videos. All right. We don't give a damn about the subscribers. We can care less who's watching it <coughs> because we know whoever's watching it is getting the true information. Hold that point. Hold, hold that point. All right, we are the third temple English church. All right, we are a royal peculiar, peculiar. All right, not only do we have a temple, we have a website. All right, we have a website. Let's go to that. Show the people why you should follow me. Give me a new computer. Y'all bear with me.
difficulty here. Bear with me, y'all. Hopefully I can fix this. Okay, this is our website. All right, the Third Trip English Church website. For all those who's watching this video, this is our website. We don't not only have a YouTube, we have a website that you can go to, all right, that tells you everything conclusively, all right, conclusively about who we are, what we are, what we're about, what we teach, why we teach it. And for who we teach it for, all right? We have laws, all right? We have our rules and regulations, our procedures, all right? Right here on this website, for all those who really want to know where the truth is, all right? Well, for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving forward, all right? So let's deal with this gentleman's perception, because he's from Cornwall, all right? He's a Corn Cornish temple. We already seen that. And we know the Cornish people come from Cornish, all right? Everybody see this? So is he a Moorish American or is he of Cornish descent? That's what he needs to be asking himself. All right. He didn't prove one out one bit that he was of Cornish descent, because the only thing he was talking about was Morris American. He also made a remark that those of Cornish descent are immigrants who migrated here. All right. This is what he says. So which one are you, brother? Cornwall is a ceremonial county in southwest England. It is recognized by the Cornish and Celtic political groups as one of the Celtic nations and is the homeland of the Cornish people, which you claim to be because you have a Cornish temple. All right. If you go to the website, you see a more American brother standing in front of this flag of the of, 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 of what we call uh, the Cornish people. Cornish flag for the Cornish people. All right. So I guess he associated with his identity as a Moor, but the Bohemian Moor, all right, which had nothing to do with the people. It just dealt with land, all right? It dealt with the particular land, Bowman Moor, okay? That's the land, not the people. Let's get a little, a little more clarity, because you didn't apparently inform the people. Let's start right here. The modern English name Cornwall is a compound of the terms coming from two different languages groups. Corn originated from proto celtic Carnu horn, presumed in reference to the headland, and the cognate with the English word horn or Latin cornu, both derived from Proto-Indo-European 
There were many also have been an iron age group that occupied the corner, principally known as corn boil, people of the horn or headland. All right. Let's get into this. Let's get let's go to a time era where we can really correlate to it because we know most of this is of the histories concerning these territories and the people are at time out of mind. It's called time immemorial. Okay. Let's bring it up to an area where we call like the ninth century. All right. So we can identify with these people. Let's do that. Right about here. In 838, the Cornish and their Danish allies. All right. So I mean that you were allied with the Danish i.e. the Vikings, all right? Because the Danish were Vikings, all right, who invaded England, all right? In 838, the Cornish and their Danish allies were defeated by Egbert in the Battle of Hinkton, all right? Hinkingstown at Hinkstestown, 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 Hinkstestown. In 875, the last recorded king of Cornwall, Dumgard, is said to have drowned. Around the 880s, Anglo-Saxon from Wessex had established modest land holdings in the north and east part of Cornwall, notably Alfred the Great, who had acquired a few estates. All right. William Marsbury, writings around 1120, says that King Asherton of England uh, fixed the boundaries between English and Cornish people at the east bank of River Tamar. By elements of the William story, like the burning of Exeter having been cast in doubt by recent writers, Asterton did reestablish a separate Cornish bishop in relations between Wessex and Cornish to improved from the time of his rule. Okay? You want references? Just click these and you can go to them. Okay? But they specifically mentioned King Edgar. It says eventually, King Edgar was able to issue charters issued charters the width of Cornwall and frequently sent emissaries or visited personally as seen by his appearances in the bold men manumissions. All right? You hear that? Bold men manumissions associated with the bold men moors, the land called bold men in reference to the manumissions that King Edgar, the peaceful, which is nothing more than our reference to what we call Jesus Christ, who I am the reincarnation of, sent emissaries as well as went himself in a pair in what we call Bowman missionary, many missions. Okay, we we'll discussed that in a second. On the Norman and Britain period, all right, this is what you should have been showing the people. On the interpretation of the Doomsday Book is that by this time, the native corners land owning class had been almost completely disposed and replaced by English landowners, particularly Harold Godwinson, who was of Danish descent, not English, all right, himself. However, the Bowman manumission showed that two leading Cornish figures nominally had Saxon names, but these were both glossed with native Cornish names. All right, did you hear that? So let's go with the, the Bowman man, man, man you mission because it said King Edgar sent emissaries as well as he personally was seen in Bowman's manumission. So what is the Bowman's manumission? Let's read that. Everybody listen. The Bowman manumission are recorded records including a manuscript gospel book, the Boatman Gospel of St. Patrick Gospel, British Library. The manuscript is mostly in Latin, but with elements of Old English and the earliest written examples of Cornish language, uh, which is thus a particular interest to language scholars and early Christian historians, Cornish historians. The manuscript was discovered by Thomas Reed in 1796 and 1849, a London bookseller and sold by him to the British Museum in May, 1883. 1883, uh, being now part of the British Library collection. It is thought to have been made in Brittany, now part of France, and dates from the last quarter of the 9th century to the first quarter of the 11th century. You hear that? Cornish 
Cornish glosses, record recorded in the old Cornish language in the margin of the gospel book are the names and details of slaves freed in Boldman, the then principal town of Cornwall, an important religious century during the 9th and 10th century. There is old, there is also old Cornish vocabulary and English Latin vocabulary from around AD 1000 to which was added about a century later a Cornish translation. Some 961 Cornish words are recorded ranging from celestial bodies through the church and craft occupation to plants and animals. This is believed it is the only original record relating to Cornwall or its bishop, which predates the Norman conquest. All right. So we know that in that time era, King Edgar was associated with uh, Cornwall and the people of Cornwall in regards to the slavery that was going on in that particular territory at that particular time. Because King Edgar reign was peaceful reign. It was a peaceful reign. All right. So you don't have a clue about what you are talking about, whoever you are from the Cornish Temple. All right? You don't have a clue about what you are. The entries seem to be contemporary, contemporaries with the mansion which they recorded. The practice of manumitting slaves in the church as recorded in the entries appears to have existed from the early 4th century. Okay? We know there were no slaves in, Eng in, in England. All right? Now, under the control of our ancestors, there wasn't. All right? Okay. So, enough about you. Let's talk about primogenitor, a birthright. Let's talk about this. Let's clear this up once and for all. Everybody claim they got a birthright, all right? Somebody claimed they got a right to an inheritance of an estate. And the highest form of estate is real property, real estate. And real estate, we know, is the land, fixtures, and, 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 and buildings attached to it. All right. We have to understand that. All right. So I'm going to put everybody heads to the bed. I'm not going to use no profanity. I'm just going to show you the proof. All right. So you don't have to slander me because you're jealous of my position as the king of England. All right. It's my it's my right to be by way of my descent of my inheritance going back to these people. All right. Yes, sir. The Plantagenet crown, founded by Godfrey, i.e. Jefferson, because son means to send down from. How did I get this surname? What is your surname? Apparently, it must be either a Morris descent or Cornish descent. You haven't yet decided yet, my brother. So let's deal with the primogenitor and the essence of what primogenitor really means and why it was abandoned here, not just under the Commonwealth under the House of Stewards and those who they got their authority, the House of Stewards got their authority from being the House of Tudors, which was the first um, uh, you've seen on the, uh, the the seal of the United States, which was the Red Rose, all right? We know that that was a cadet, plant, cadet branch of the Plantagenet uh, uh, branch of the Angerian crown founded by John, the one who signed the Magna Carta, signed, son of Henry II, son of God for the fifth kind of Grand Jew. Okay, these are straight undiluted facts that not even you can deny. All right, let's deal with the primogenitor, which is the right by law or custom of the firstborn legitimate child to inherit the parents' entire or main estates and preference to share inheritance among all or some children, any illegitimate child or any collateral relative. All right. In most contexts, it means the inheritance of the firstborn son, agnetic primogenitor. But you're dealing from an abstract or concrete, this is what it deals with. All right. In most contexts, it means the inheritance of the firstborn son, agnetic primogenitor. It can also mean by the firstborn daughter, matrilineal primogenitor, or firstborn child, absolute primogenitor. All right. We know matrilineal is not the the the, the way. We did it in England. This practice was adopted in here in North America. 
all right? To what we call, um, uh, what they call it, um, a part two sequitur via trend, the status of the mother, all right? Description. Let's deal with this, y'all. Come on. Let's go. All right. Tell me which one of y'all got a legal claim in regards to some type of right to an estate based upon the laws dealing with inheritance. Tell me one person, whether criminal or civil, all right, based upon your right, especially as a Morris American or any other religious society here in North America, based off some right promise in regards to some type of inheritance that makes reference to some type of land, all right? Order of succession and minarchies. So we see that primogeniture in reference to an heir, a male, which is the preference in regards to the inheritance of a, a state, all right, left from an ancestor, all right, left from an ancestor. We call it agnetic succession, all right, agnetic succession. Let's look at that, agnetic. How many of y'all know what that word is? Agnatic succession. I just seen it. Okay, here we go. We're talking about primogeniture. All right? Primogeniture. The male heir in lieu of inheritance of a state from a, from a past heir who, who most likely was a king. All right? We see anatic seniority is a patrilineal principle of inheritance where the order of succession to the throne prefers the minor's younger brother over the minor's own sons. A minor child succeeds only after the male of the elder, elder, elder generation have all been exas, exhausted. And that seniority in, excludes females of the dynasty and their descendants from the succession. Did everybody hear that? All right, this is not biased, it's just how our ancestors did it. Let's go to the examples. In many cultures, surnames are agnatically determined. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? In many cultures, surnames are agnatically determined. In the English culture, surnames are agnatically determined based on primogeniture. Okay? Let's say an example. 
and Jibrian Empire. The county of Madhu followed the inheritance by adding the Nedic seniority. When Henry II of England married Eleanor of Aquitaine, creating the Angibian Empire, this resulted in some question over what inheritance law would affect their children. As Henry II's father was the Count of Anjou, and he inherited England and Normandy through his mother. This is God for the fifth Count of Anjou, son of folk, the ruler of Jerusalem. All right? Henry II is the son of Godfrey, the fifth kind of Anjou. We know that agnatic seniority is determined by the surname in some cultures, which in the English culture is determined because we're proving it right now. We just read it. The county of Anjou followed the inheritance by agnatic seniority. When Henry II of England married Eleanor of Aquitaine, it created the Angivian powder. This resulted in some question over what inheritance law would affect their children. Okay? We know Eleanor Aquitaine was of Frankish line, all right? Henry II was not of Frankish line. He descended down from the, the line of the kings of Wessex, right, which was from France. Frankish and French descent are not the same because no, we know Frankish are those who invaded France when France became part of Normandy by way of Godfrey the fifth kind of Anjou, all right? When he married... Uh, Matilda, all right? Empress Matilda. You got to know this history. All right. It says here. The county of Madhu followed the inheritance by a natural seniority when Henry II married Eleanor Alcatraine, creating the Angivian Empire. This resulted in some question over what inheritance laws would affect their children. As Henry II's father was the Count of Anjou, and he inherited England normally through his mother, Henry's eldest son, the young Henry, died before he, him. So the throne passed to his next oldest son, which is the first of England, which is where we get the concept, what we call time and memorial, time out of mind, okay? Henry II's third son, Godfrey II, Duke of Brittany, died three years before his father. But his pregnant wife later gave birth to his son, Arthur of Brittany, all right? This is where the problem came in. When Richard was mortally wounded during the castle siege on his deathbed, he named his brother John, Henry II's fourth and youngest son, as his heir. However, the inheritance was questioned by the young Arthur Brittany, then 12 years old. Arthur argued that uh, as the son of John's older brother Godfrey, Duke of Brittany, he was the rightful heir mm -hmm. of the Richard and Henry II, according to the laws of agnatic promulgation, which were followed in England and Normandy. John countered that as the male line heir of the Counts of Anjou, uh, Counts of Anjou, the Angivian Empire followed succession laws of Anjou, which was based upon agnatic seniority. Thus, John claimed that as Richard's younger brother, he stood in line ahead of his nephew. Arthur continued to press his claims for the next four years, allying with the King of France against John through Richard's deathbed declaration of John as his heir proved greater strength to his claim. Ultimately, Arthur was captured in battle, imprisoned, and presumed, presumably killed by John. The matter was never definitely decided, as John lost all continental possession in France and, his, and had his language to any claim in the rule of Anjou. All right? So this became a, 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 a war over succession who would inherit the English throne. All right? We call this uh, the War of the Roses. That's the reason why Henry III, son, Edward I, put in place what we call statutes of Quinn Imperatoris and what we call the statutes of Intel. All right? The donuts conditioned the bus. Did you hear that? King Edward I put in place the statutes of Queen Imperatoris as well as the statutes of Don, Don conditioned the bus. All right? These both would deal with um, the, um, the, the uh, prohibition of selling land uh, uh, by way of subterfugation, all right? The land can only be transferred uh, by way of what we call substitution, meaning putting another tenant in place of the other tenant who had an obligation to a landlord, all right, as the tenant of chief, all right? So if that contract or that agreement based off the fee that was given was terminated as a result of substitution, then the obligations of the prior tenant goes to the new tenant, all right? 
You must understand that concept because the only way you had in the state and the land based off an inheritance, you must get it from a landlord who was obligated to bring common soakers to the lord of the land, which was the king. Simple. All right? Simple. All right, let's get there. Back to promotion of the church. And I'm using Wikipedia. All right, let's go ahead. History. I'm going to give you the abstract and the concrete. In regards to primogeniture of the male heir, the firstborn. All right. From the biblical or abstract understanding, the earliest count of primogeniture to be known widely in modern time is that of Isaac, son of Esau, who was the born first, and Jacob, who was born second. Esau was entitled to the birthright, but he sold the right to Jacob for a mess of potent pottage i.e. a small amount of little cow stew. This passage demonstrates that primogeniture was known in the Middle East prior to the Roman Empire. So this is the abstract story that most of you actually use in regards to your claim to inheritance of some type of the state promised from a long forgotten ancestor that you can't prove actually existed in regards to some type of interest in the state based upon equitable uh, lines versus uh, uh, factual lines. Because anything that's presumed to be a fact can be proven wrong if it's rebutted by another fact. All right? So we have to really deal with the true right in lieu of this birthright called inheritance to some type of state. Because this particular state that's, that's claimed by Jacob was based upon a vision. All right? Jacob's ladder, Jacob, uh, and Jacob's dream. Everybody know that story, all right? That's an abstract story that does not make sense, all right? But it all deals with God's house, all right? He named that place where Jacob fell asleep as Bethel, the house of El, the house of God, all right? The house of God. That's the abstract. Let's go to the concrete now. I'm not Roman, so I don't need their interpretation. Matter of fact, this does have significance right here. Under Roman law, during the Roman Empire, Roman law governed much of Europe, and the law pertained to inheritance made no distinction between the oldest or younger male or female if the descendants died interstate. Did y'all hear that? If the descendants die interstate, they made no preference to either male or female, old or young. They didn't care, right? Because they had nothing to deal with an heir. This is when the land switched from entail to fee simple under Roman law. Although a mission to the highest order, i.e. the senators and equestrians, potentially brought lifelong privileges that the next generation could inherit. The principles of inheriting rank in general was, li li was little used. Rather, rather, Roman aristocracy was based on competition, and a Roman family could not maintain a position in, or, in, the, in the orders merely by hereditary succession or title to land. Although the eldest son typically carried his father's name in some form, he was expected to construct his own career based on a competence as an administrator or general in or remaining in favor with the emperor of his council at court. All right? So it was no longer based off primogenitor and that succession. It was now it's based on a position, all right? A rank, a title, an office, administrator, or a general, as we see here. Let's read on.
All right, here we go. Right here. Give us examples, historical examples. All right, here we go. Everybody listening, all right? In more complex medieval cases, the sometimes conflicting principles of proximity of blood and primogeniture comp comp competed, competed, and outcomes were at times unpredictable. Proximity meant that an area closer in degree of kinship to the lower in question was given precedence, although that area was not necessarily the heir by primogeniture. All right. Now to give us an example, the Burgundian succession. All right. This deal with the Frankish kings, because the Bur Bur Burgundian successions were broken down from what we call the Capitine dynasty. All right? They all descended from the Carolingians and the Merovingians, not like those of the Anglo-Saxons. All right? The Burgundian succession in 1361 were resolved in King John the Second, in favor of King John II, son of Charles' daughter, a basis of blood proximity, being a near cousin of dead Duke. Charles II of Norway, grandson of the eldest Norway is a Spanish uh, uh, king, all right? Uh, grandson of the eldest daughter of son Janine. John was only one generation of consanguinity removed from the last duke instead of two, instead of two for Charles. So this is in the 14th century. But the one they have next is the dispute over the Scottish succession, all right? Very important, because they only give you three. Burgundian, Scottish succession, and the Earldom of Glaston, just so. All right. Scottish succession is the one in question because we know that the Scottish kings and monarchs under King James on down were the ones who were mo moving under what we call uh, Commonwealth, better known as the Republic, when the crown was severed and it was moving under what they call an interregnum through what we call the war, uh, uh, the, the, the English Civil War or what we call the War of the Three Kingdoms. But before the War of the Three Kingdoms, you have what we call the dispute between the Scottish succession, which resulted in the Scottish independence of 1295 under Edward I, who was of the Plantagenet dynasty because he was the son of Henry III, all right? It says here, a dispute over the Scottish succession, 1290-1292, the Bruce family pleaded tenistry and proximity of blood Whereas Belio argued his claim based on primogeniture. The arbiter Edward I decided in favor of primogeniture, but later the independent wars reverted the situation in favor of Bruce due to the political extensions. Okay? So we know that Scottish independence came by way of their independence that was gained through Edward I, King of England. All right? This gets to what we call the War of the Roses. The war over the proximity of blood. Who was their closest uh, kindred, but also who fed the description as the male heir to sit in that uh, that that position as the one who was enthroned as a result of living up to the uh, uh, the qualities that the the position inquires or in count, uh, 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 details. We know that position, people change, but positions don't. All right? So if you're sitting in the English throne under the English crown, then you must be working under the English prerogative. This is what you people lack. The king. Let's move forward. Promogeniture. Let's deal with promogeniture. Yeah, we're going to promogeniture. All right, let's move there. Let's go back to Fetal. All right. Let's go back to Fetal. We know primogenitor deal with a male heir. Not all male heirs, but one male heir. One specific male heir in regards to the throne. All right. They're, they're not arguing over uh, 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 property. They're arguing over the, the, the power of the government, the seat of government. That's what's being argued over. 
You know what I'm saying? Because we know all the land that belongs to the crown is intel. That's where the word fetal comes from. Crown land is intel, and it's intel is uh, what we call crown land. It can't be separated because it's personified by the crown. All right? Let's read this. In English common law, fetal or entail or telezy in Scots law, Scottish law is a form of trust and starts by a deed or a settlement that restricts the settlement inheritance of an estate and real property and prevents that property from being sold, devised by will or otherwise alienated by the tenant in possession. Instead, it causes it to pass automatically by operation of law to an heir determined by the settlement deed. So anybody claim to have a right to some inheritance here, including you from the Cornish uh, 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 temple, then you need to ask yourself this question, all right? Do you have a right to uh, uh, the land which is in question? I don't know his name, Archbishop, some guy, uh, uh, apparently associated with the more Scientific of America, he just didn't, he just uh, called himself the Cornish Temple, all right? And if you look on some of his um, lectures, you see him standing behind uh, the Cornish flag uh, uh, and standing in fidelity, all right? So that means he's associating the more Scientific of America with the Cornish uh, uh, Temple which deals with the Cornish people. And we know the Cornish people, he said in his own video that they were the foreigners. So you, he must be a foreigner in question. All right. In English common law, fee tail or entail or telelized in Scottish law. We didn't call it telelized. We call it fee tail or entail. It's a form of trust established by a deed or settlement that restricts the sale or an inheritance of an estate and real property and prevents that property from being so devised by will or will otherwise or otherwise alienated by the tenant in possession. Okay? The tenant in possession. And instead called it to pass automatically by operation of law to an heir determined by the settlement deed. All right. We know a deed is nothing more than the instrument of conveyance of a property from one person to another. Usually it's from the grantor to the grantee. The grantee is assumed to be an owner, but has not yet been proved. OK, because most of the conveyances is not done in fee tail or entail. It's done in fee and simple. Fee tail deeds are in contrast to fee simple deeds, possessions of which are an unrestricted title to property and are empowered to be quetched. Uh, uh, or dispose of it as they wish. This is called alienation, all right? So you're alienating land, which is a violation of what Intel inquires that you cannot alienate land. It, put, it must pass towards air by what we call operation of law, all right? If it does pass to somebody other than the air and doesn't pass by operation of law, then that's called fee simple, which is an unrestricted title to property and our power to be it or dispose of it to anybody. Knowing that, that, and that only comes to what we call the eminent domain power, or what we call compulsory power or acquisition power. Okay? The power of acquisition. Fee tail deeds are in contrast to fee simple deeds, possessors of which have an unrestricted title to the property and are empowered to request or dispose of it as they wish. Although it may be subject to the allodial title of the minor or of a governing body with the powers of eminent domain. So only two people have the supreme power over the land that's governed under fee simple. Whether it's entail or fee simple, only two people can have that power. If it's fee tail, then that would be the minor. If it's eminent domain, then that would be the power of the state. Okay? Everybody, I hope y'all better understand that. Equivalent legal content exists, formerly exists in many other European countries and elsewhere. All right? Most common law jurisdictions have abolished fetales or greatly restricted their use. Did you hear that? So when they abolish fetales, they abolish primogeniture. All right? The right of the male heir. All right? 
to survive, so most common law jurisdictions have abolished the detail or greatly restricted their use. They survived in limited form in England and Wales, but have been abolished in Scotland, Ireland, and all but four states of the United States. Okay? All but four states of the United States, and the United States don't have the authority to abolish anything. Okay? Not at all. There we go. Statute of Westminster, II, passed 1285, created a fixed form of this estate. The new laws were also formed called the Statutes de Donuts Conditional Bus. All right? This is from the Edward I. All right? He passed this law, the Donuts Conditional Bus. This law is in New Jersey by statute. All right? But for the sake of time, let's move forward. All right? Fetal. Promogenitor is the same as fetal. So what is crown land? Because if fetal and entail is the same and, it's, and, it's, and it can't be alienated, then what is crown land? Because we know promogenitor did with a male heir. Right, one male heir. You don't have an inheritance if you don't have, can't prove you have the right to be on the land. Crown land. Crown land. Sometimes spelled crown land, also known as the road domain, is a territory area belonging to the monarch who personifies the crown. It is equivalent of an entailed estate and passes with the monarchy being inseparable from it. Today, in Commonwealth when crown land is considered public land and is part from the and is part from the monarch private estate. So Commonwealth Wims is called public land or federal land, which is called the uh, public domain. It belongs to the crown, and the crown is, is, is personified by the minor, okay? So that means you need a king. Thank you, Count of Searchy, if you're here, for making that uh, 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 that video in lieu of Brother Truth claiming that there ain't no English minor. Because he wanted to use the king's prerogative, without, but that is not your prerogative. Because if you use the prerogative of the king and, 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 or, and, and, and lieu of a remedy in these courts, it's uh, what we call, um, it becomes uh, discretionary on their part. Because you ain't the king. You ain't the king. That shows how ignorant you are, Brother True. You are not the king. So once again, crown land, also known as royal domains, the territory area, belonging to the monarch who personifies the crown. It is equivalent, equal of an entail estate, passive with the minor, being inseparable from it, being separable from it. So a crown land is synonymous with fetal, right? It's synonymous with fetal estate, contract the uh, fee simple, all right, with restricted inheritance of, of an estate, right, because it belongs to that male heir based off the laws of identity succession, what we call primogenitor. All right, primogenitor. All right, primogenitor, the legitimate heirs. Everybody here in North America are not legitimate heirs. You're a bastard. You've been bastardized. Okay? You don't have you don't have a nation to go home to. You don't have a law of a nation to protect you here in, 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 in these lands, on these lands here, or in these lands. What law can you use to protect you as a national on these lands? We got our laws. They're right here. They're in place for us. I'm going to prove it to you. All right? 
Promogenitor deals with the right of the firstborn, not all the firstborn, but the firstborn child to inherit the parent's entire main estate in preference to a shared inheritance among all or some children, any illegitimate child or collateral relative. Okay? So that, that involves fetal. Let's go to the fetal before I move on again. Let's deal with the concept of fetal. The purpose. The fetal allow a patriarch to perpetuate his bloodline, family name, honors, and armorials in the persons of a series of powerful and wealthy male descendants by keeping his estate intact in the hands of one heir alone and an ideally indefinite and preordained chain of succession. Did you hear that? So who has stepped up to the plate who bears the surname Jefferson? Name one. Give me one. Give me one person who bears the surname Jefferson who has lived up to the status of being the first male legitimate heir based off the bloodline, the family name, the honor and on memorials that is associated with the family name called the birthright. One. One. That one must be the king. Because fetal is entail and entail is crown land which is personified by the king. I hope y'all understand what's being said. That's why they abolished promogenitor intel estates because they didn't want the king to be born. All right, let's get there. I'm pretty sure y'all got that, all right? Let's get to the proof. Queen of Petaurus. I might pull that up real quick. By effectively ending the practice of subjugation, Queen of Pretoria hastened the end of feudalism in England. Although it had already been on the decline for quite some time, direct feudal obligations were increasingly being replaced by cash rent and outright sales of land, which gave rise to the practice of library of maintenance or bastard feudalism. The retention and control by the nobility of land, money, soldiers, and servants via direct salaries and land sales and rent payments. By the mid 15th century, the major nobility were able to assemble estates, some of estates, some of the monies and private armies on retainers do post Queen Imperatorial lands management practices and direct sale of land. It is thought by history such as Charles Plummer that this then developed into one possible underlying causes of the War of the Roses. Other sources indicate the edges of bastard feudalism as early as the 11th century and the form of library of maintenance and the elements of classical feudalism are significant and late as the 15th 
century. Okay? We must understand that. So Great Inventories was actually initiated to stop the alienating of land. All right? It only allowed substitution. All right? This was called the statute of our Lord King the, concerning the selling and buying of land. Okay? The buying or selling of land passed in 1290 by Edward the first of the Plantagenet crown, who I am a direct descendant of. Granny Petorus, all right? The King Abolition Act passed by Charles II from the House of Stuart uh, was an act that ended all uh, uh, fiddle tingers and allowed to remain in the free and common soldiers. All right. That means that no estates should be uh, uh, given under what we call fee simple estates at all. No fee simple estates should be uh, uh, given to anybody whatsoever because the tingers were abolished by Charles II, all right? In regards to the lands that were held in town, all right? By the lands that were held in town, that brings me to the statute of distribution. Anybody ever heard of that? Let's look at that. 1670. The statute of distribution was an act of parliament in England in 1670. It dealt with the administration of interstate estates. It was made perpetual by the Administration of Interstate Act of 1685 by King James II. Okay? Very important. These acts are very important. All right? I'm going to show you in a second. The whole act so far as it applies to death occurring after the commencement of the Administration Act of 1925. So the Administration Act of 1685 was remodeled after the Administration of the State Act of 1925. All right? We see that. We're going to visit both of them. All right? So the Statute of Distribution was passed by King Charles II, which was modified by the Administration Act of 1685 and then modified after the Administration Act of 1925. Okay, so let's deal with both of them. Statute of distribution of 1670. Now let's go to the statute of fraud. All right, because the statute of distribution distribution is associated with the statutes of frauds. Let's prove it. Ah, here we go. Statute of Frauds. Statute of Frauds was an act of parliament by King Charles II in 1677. He also passed the Statute of Dis Distribution in 1670. So this act came after 1660, 1670. The Statute of Frauds was an act by the Parliament of England 
that require that certain types of contracts, wills, and grants, and assignments or surrender or leases or interest in real property must be in writing and signed to avoid fall on the court by perjury and subordination of perjury. And also require that the documents of the court be signed and dated. All right. So the statute falls with a law created by the Parliament of England to make sure that all contracts, wills, especially these be in writing by both parties to make sure that it won't be fought upon the court and what we call perjury. All right. Very important we understand that. Why? Because when you deal with the statute of frauds, it goes into what we call uh, the administration. Let me see if we can get it. Oh, statute of distribution. All right, here we go. Statute of distribution. Back there again. All right. The whole act, so far as it applies to death, occurred after the commencement on the Administration Act of 1925. Okay, very important. Let's look at the Administration Act of 1925. All right. This statute of distribution, as it said, it relates to the statutes of frauds. We hear that? Do we see that? So the statute of distribution relates to the statute of frauds. It was repealed by the Administration Act of 1925. All right, once again, the statutes of frauds are, is associated with the statute of distribution, which we're reading now. This is a, this is a, what we call, uh, as they said, um, operation of law. Statute of distribution is called operation of law. Okay. Statute of distribution is called operation of law. All right. And it said the it's associated with the statutes of frauds. All right. And it said the statutes of distribution are. Uh, 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 it's associated with the Administrative Act of 1925, all right, of 1925. Let's deal with that. Administrative Act of 1925 by the British Parliament, okay? It didn't say English Parliament. It said the British Parliament. All right. So you got the statute of frauds, which is associated with the statute of distribution. The statute of distribution was in 1670. The statute of frauds was in 1677. Okay. The administration of uh, a state was in 1865, which was remodeled again after administration of state of Act of 1925, which is now passed by the Parliament of England, but British by the British Parliament, okay, in regards to the consolidating reform and <coughs> simplify, simplify, simplify the rules relating to the administration of the states in England and well, all right, follow the rabbit hole. All authority, principal reform based off the Ministry Act of 1925 by the British Parliament. All authority that a personal representative had with respect to chattel real, such as fixtures, was extended to cover any matter dealing with real estate as well. With respect to the property of any estate accepting intel interest, there were abolished. Okay, so every other estate other than intel estate were abolished under the Administration of a State Act of 1925 by the British Parliament, okay? In regards to chattel property, i.e. personal property, such as fixtures, 
an extent to cover matters associated with what we call real estate, i.e. real property. Y'all better listen to where I'm going with it, okay? Because this is why they put it in writing. All right? This is why they put it in writing. Now, we're talking about the intel estates, which the those two heirs who have died interstate, and when they die interstate, they deceased to the state, or the which is the colony under the sovereign power of the colony through the eminent domain power, which is we call acquisition of sovereignty by way of prescription of sovereignty, which is a, a, a easement, a non-possessory possessory use, and something that you do not own. Okay, so you're administering the estates of heirs, and we know heirs' estates are estates of intel contrast to estates in fee simple because fee simple was done through the process of common recovery, which is what we call subfudation, right? Subfudation is alienating property. Once again, alienation voluntarily or involuntary. All right, let's get there. Statute of frauds, statute of Disp distribution, administrative of administration of the states act are all uh, paramount to understanding the puzzle that you are in. All right, it's a lock box that they have locked you in, and I'm going to unlock it by unlocking your minds. Okay, the proper way of administering your estate, okay? That's entail because all other forms of estates were abolished, as we see here. Act 45. All right? All other states were abolished. Look at all these laws passed by our ancestors. Other legislation. Ever the first, ever the first, ever the first, ever the third, ever the third, ever the third, Henry the Eighth, Henry the Eighth, Elizabeth the First, Statue of Distribution, Charles the Second, James the First. All right? So they all right there. These are all at our disposal as being part of the third temple, the third temple English Church of England, which has its own body of politics that were severed when they severed the intel estates from the primogeniture associated with the male heir, a legitimate heir, because all heirs under the Scottish kings were what we call de facto minor. We know de facto and de jure is totally different. We know de facto means uh, uh, the factual ability to do something, whereas though de jure means the legal right to do something. All right? The legal right to do something. All right, let's deal with it. So the statute of distribution is associated with the statute of frauds. All right. Right there. Y'all think it just don't apply to y'all. All right. Y'all really think this don't apply to y'all when it does. All right. The statute of frauds. All right. Relates to the statute of distribution. All right. This was repealed by the administration of the state of 1925. All right. English Parliament and British Parliament were still holding up our rights to our birthrights. They were still preserving our birthrights as English heirs and successors, not as no other person but English heirs and successors. Let's prove it. New Jersey Law Commission. We went over this already. 
statute of frauds. Nineteen ninety one. New Jersey statute of frauds, like similar enactments of every state, derives from the statute from the prevention of frauds and perjury passed by Parliament in 1677 by Charles II. He also passed the statute of distribution in 1670. All right. It says here, let's go a little further. Right here. The land provision of the statute of fraud. Nowhere are the English origins of the American legal system more apparent than in the law of real property. Both our statutes and judicial decisions on the subject are founded in the concept that were established in England over five centuries prior to 1776. Keep that year in mind. In particular, the codified laws of the state still incorporate century old English statutes that establish fundamental property laws principles. Uh, uh, 46.3-5, Statute of Quint and Pretorius, Terum, the Statute of Uses, as well as the Statutes of Fraud. Okay? We know that the Statute of Quint and Pretorius was passed by Edward I, the Statute of Uses was passed by Henry VIII, and we know the Statutes of Fraud were passed by Charles II. All right? 1677. Whereas New Jersey has coded and the revised Statute 25 colon 1 dash 1 through 5. Okay? We see it right here. Yeah, we see it right there. Let's get to the let's get some more proof. All right. Y'all want receipts? I give you receipts. Promotionator and its Intel Estates in America. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? Promotionator and Intel Estates in America. Background messing up. Give me a second. All right. Promogenitor. Intel Estates in America. I got any moderators here today? Let's see how they lied to us. All right. Here's proof that they robbed you of your estate. 
All right, as in this area of successes. Who did that? The 13 colleges known as the United States. They did it. Here's your proof. Okay? Here's your proof. How many people fight in lieu of this proof? How many people were building this proof? This is from Columbia Law Review. Did y'all hear that? Columbia Law Review. How, how could you argue with a law review from Columbia? All right? We know Columbia is one of the universities that were created in England. All right? Prominent and Intel estate in America. So this applies here, not in England. Here. Okay? And what we just, what I just briefed you on in regards to the law passed by Parliament and the Brit by English Parliament and, and the British Parliament are going to apply here. Okay? In the United States. It says the rule has obtained generally in the United States for over a century that on the death of an in, of interstate seized of real property and fee simple, such property descends to his or her children equally, subject to the varying rights of the surviving husband or wife. In England, on the other hand, it is only since the new administration of the state acts, which went into effect on January 1st, 1926, that the descent to the eldest son in fee simple has been abolished. The attitude of this country early in its history may be the attitude to the social philosophy in the colonies and on the experience which had been universal, unfavorable to the preservation of primogeniture. Did y'all hear that? Did you hear that? We know that Fee simple were abolished under the Ministry Act of 1925, as passed by uh, the British Parliament, going back all the way to Queen of Pretoria in 1290. Okay? It was abolished. You couldn't alienate land or subterfuge land that belongs to heir through Intel land because Intel land was crown land and is personified by the crown which is based upon the laws of promogeniture, agnatic succession. If you erase that promogeniture in regards to intel state, then you can't have a minor. That means you have no estate, and it goes interstate because there ain't no heirs, and it's either taken by the crown, which was personified by the king, or it's taken by the eminent domain, domain power of the state, all right? Through acquisition of sovereignty, through prescription of sovereignty, they claim to be the sovereign. Under the, as a de facto sovereign, which is a factual ability to do so under the presumptive law versus the legal right to do so. All right? Very important that you understand that. So it says, the Administration of the State Act of 1926 abolished fee simple that is being practiced here in North America. All right? Rhode Island, Rhode Island in this, as in much else, was the black sheep of New England's flock. And except for intervals of 10 years from 1718 to 1728, land descended to the eldest son, although there is a considerable evidence in the 17th century of uncertainty and lack of unanimity. Pennsylvania following Massachusetts reserved a mere double portion for the eldest son, but in New York and in, in the In the Southern County, Palmer was the rule of inheritance. Did y'all hear that? Yes, it was. It was codified as a statute of law. All right? We've been talking about that. When you say Palmer Dirt, it says a male heir because all crown land is personified by the male heir who personifies the crown. So if you look for a statue in lieu of promulgator, it must be befitting under the provocative set forth by a king to represent the agnetic succession based upon uh, surname, descent, hierarchy, uh, and those things of that nature. All right? As, let's go do it again. Promulgator.
Primogeniture is the right by law or custom of the firstborn legitimate child to inherit the parent's entire or main estate. Remember, there was no heirs here in North America. Brother Stoney. There was no heir to North America because the status of the child was under uh, 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 Part 2, Secretary B. Trim, the status of the mother. Okay? One. Two, um, the land was not subject to the intel state because it was under the power of the eminent domain power of the states. And the states were uniform under the Confederacy, right? The highest form of ownership in North America is fee simple. Fee simple is a result of alienating the land through common recovery was a process created by lawyers. This is the reason why when you close in a and 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 a closing ceremony is done by way of an attorney, all right, being witnessed by a notary public, all right, that a conveyance to the land had to be done based off the grantor and the, and the grantee. But it doesn't prove that the conveyance, which is the instrument that you hold in lieu of the uh, proof that you have some interest in it, doesn't prove you own it. Because you can't own it if it has encompasses. The state has gives encompasses to any type of uh, easement that you have in some type of property based off the adverse possession, which is how you acquired the property by way of what we call foreclosure, all right? When land is taken for public use based off the eminent domain power of the state, which results from its seatment. All these things need to be understood in regards to why the land was taken in the first place because of primogenitor, that male heir. That male heir was that one who inherited the estates because we know that when there's no heirs and the interstate, the crown steps in to take that bond of that abandoned property. So as a result of ain't no heirs being here, the only person that can take it back is the crown, i.e. the king, and we distribute it out again. I hope that was clear. Let's move forward. Homogenitor. So we know that a legitimate heir is based upon that male heir to inherit the entire estate. All right? We know the king governed the entire estate, which was under the crown. We know crown land was an empire under the British government. Crown land, what we call the uh, British America, was called the British Empire. We know the British Empire was controlled by British monarchs going back to the unification in 1707. Prior to that, the monarchs ruling the Great Britain didn't get their independence to 1290 through the Scottish independence as a result of Edward I, who was the King of England, who instituted laws from Parliament of England going back to status of Queen Victoria that says that the land cannot be given to no one other than heirs. If you're an heir, then you must be of his family. And that family was the Plantagenet dynasty because he was of the Plantagenet dynasty. The son of Henry III, son of Henry II, son of John, son of God, the fifth kind of man, Jew, son of folk, the ruler of Jerusalem. That's why it's called folk land. The Lord of the old land is called folk land. Let's prove it. Oh, yes. 
let's do it. Let's try it. The library of season. This is how we usually transfer land, do library of season. All right, which was done going back to the methods of conveying land by way of library of deed or library of uh, law. All right, library of deed or library of law. You got three types of conveyances. Uh, two, three, yeah, no, two. Library of law and library of uh, deed, all right? If you didn't have those two, then it falls under what we call primary season, which denotes to the king. All right, let's see. Season. Everybody understand this. And we walk you to our platform so we can discuss this, all right? All right, because the way library of season was done. Let me go back here. Larry of season. Larry of season could refer to either library of a deed whereby the parties met together on the land and the transfer symbolically delivered possession of the land by handing over a twig or a clump of earth to the recipient or by livery of law, whereby the parties went within the site of the land and the transferor declared to the recipient that the possession was being given, followed by the recipient entering onto the land. This is called prophecy, y'all. Prophecy. I have the keys to the prophecy of how the land will be delivered because library is synonymous with delivering or delivery. All right. It can even be done by way of how it was conveyed by library of deed back in the days of our ancestors who was Asherton, which means noble stone. All right. Or library of law. All right. But the statutes of fall were created because they abolished this process called lobby of deed and lobby of law. Let's let's look at it. Where is it at? Statute of frauds. Right, right here. I can care what you care less what you say, but I remember what you say, what you said. All right, you got to come this way for your redemption process. And yes, I say that proudly. Why? Because I've done the work. All right, I'm showing you. You can't claim no freedom on no land that you don't belong. And that question will be coming soon to you at your front door. Because the writing requirement for land transaction is so fundamental to our present day conveyance system, it can be difficult to imagine a time when it was otherwise. In England, prior to the statute of frauds, however, the transfer of land by ceremony rather than by writing was still valid. You hear that? Rather than by valid. What, what instrument can any one of you can claim that you have a right to land? What deed can you present? What based off a library of deed, all right? Let alone library of law, because your law that you use in regards to the estate that you claim to have is based off an abstract interpretation of some type of uh, inheritance, not no concrete, because there must be some instrument conveying the land based off the processes that exist in conveying a land, which I'm showing you are processes that's recognized in New Jersey. Right? It's said because the writing crimes for land for action is so fundamental to the present day conveyance system, it can be difficult to imagine a time when it was otherwise. So prior to this system that they got, which is called the recorder of deeds or registry of deeds, they didn't have a way of conveying land because they didn't own any land. Because 
they were illiterate on how to convey land. The only piece of people who were not illiterate, illiterate on conveying land was those who had a right to own the land under what we call lottery of seizure, all right, which is through lottery of deed and lottery of law, okay? It says here, the method of conveyance lottery of seeds is derived from feudal concept of land owning. Feudal concept or the method was workable with most of the population was illiterate and ownership of land was a matter of common knowledge in the community. In the 17th century, this type of conveyance had largely been superseded by more modern written form of conveyance and the old forms increasingly were used with a secret conveyance was wanted for illicit purposes. Did you hear it, y'all? Did you hear this? The lawmakers of the day came to recognize that the ceremonial conveyance of land facilitated tax evasion, fraudulent transfer of land, and made litigation over titles to land more difficult to resolve. The statute of fraud changed the conveyance in practice in England by expressly eliminating conveyances of land by lobby of season or by requiring conveyance of land to be in writing, which is why the statute of fraud was created. So back to lobby of season. Lobby of D and lobby of law. We acquired the law by lobby of D and lobby of law, right? Because the deed is nothing more than an instrument that's being conveyed uh, from one part to another. We got the right to create a deed in lieu of the, the commands made by our ancestors under the authority of the crown, all right? Through lobby of law, because it was declared in law through what they call the DAS statute of distrib distribution, which is what we call what we call operation of law. Okay? That's how we are able to get this off because it's done by operation of law through statute of distribution. All right? Statute of distribution relates to the statute of fraud that all conveyances be in writing because those conveyances that were, con were in writing were not the normal process of how land was conveyed going back to our ancestors. All right? Based upon the person conveying the land, because the ceremonial known as the twig and the turf was based upon those uh, customary laws or ceremonial laws that goes back to the kings of Wessex. Let's see. William Penn used the ceremony, and he did it unlawfully to acquire territory, territory that he did not own. It says here, the lucky newcomer goes to his given acre and cuts a turf from the selected site and drops two shillings in the hole made. All right. The high steward of the county then twitches him with a twig and stick and twig in the turf, then hands it to him saying, this turf and twig I give to thee as free as Asherton gave to me and hope that hope a loving brother thou will be. So that means that if you receive the turf based off a twig that was given to you from the grantor, and the grantor was the king, Asherton, and whoever the grant was given to by way of the grantee was a landlord, all right, who had the right to sub, uh, 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 give the land by way of tenancy, all right, through tenure, all right? We know Asherton was the son of who? Alfred the Great. And look at the complexion of this brother, all right? He, he was an Anglo-Saxon Berber, all right? An Anglo-Saxon Berber. You just can't call yourself an Anglo-Saxon Berber. You had to be associated with the, the, the Anglo-Saxon Berber body of politics, all right? You must be a member of the church, the Anglo-Saxon church, better known as the English Third Temple Church of England. Outside of that, you have no remedy. All right? You have no remedy. Let's get there. So back to primogeniture. 
page three. Promogeniture, the name of this book is Morris Promogeniture Intel Estates in America. It says here, the first attack on primogeniture appears to have taken place in Rhode Island in 1718, but the result was not tangible. The Jeffersonian offenses in Virginia in 1776 bore immediate fruit. Georgia in 1777, North Carolina in 1784, Virginia in 1785, Maryland and New York in 1786, South Carolina in 1791, Rhode Island in 1798, and all under all all under the influence of backcountry party abolished primogeniture. And during the same period, the New England group of state, together with Pennsylvania, which had preserved the mosaic double portion for the elder son, dispensed with the liberal endowment and by statute provided for equal divisions among the children. These statutes were not completely effectual for today in some jurisdictional intel of states to send to the elder son. This situation. This situation is true. It is not very widespread, for in the very majority of American states, an emulation of the example of Virginia in 1776, there is a legislation aimed at the abolition of intel. One group by one group by statute abolished the detail by making a fee simple in, in its first takeover. You hear that? One group by statute abolished the fee tail by making it a fee simple in the first take takeover. There is a second group of a few states in which intel are preserved by statute merely for the life of a donee intel or are made life estate and the first donee with remainder and fee simple either to the children or to the person to whom at common law the estate would pass to at his death. Did y'all hear that? So it says that the true takeover of the primogeniture uh, was by changing from intel to fee simple, which was done by Thomas Jefferson through the Virginia Assembly. Okay? Let's go right here. There is a third group without legislation on the subject, and largely the statute, the donors condition the bus. The cornerstone of fetal would be enforced, but the few courts in which the question has been raised seem to be divided on that question. In the fourth group of states, to the consideration of which this paper is directed, the fetal subsists, but the tenant and tell is permitted to convey the property in fee simple, usually by ordinary deed. Did y'all hear that? It crooks. By ordinary deed. In Massachusetts, the statute provided that a person's seized of land intended entail may convey such land if he's simple by a deed in by a deed by a deed form, as if he were seized there and fee simple. And such conveyance shall bar the estate tell and all be meant in reversion ex expected thereupon. Thereon, you hear that? This statute does not abolish intel estates. And in the event of the failure of the tenant intel to convey a fee simple, the land is subject to the common law rule of primogeniture as they had evolved by 1312 and the interpretation of the statute of their donors condition the books with the associated evils. This was the law in New Jersey before 1820 and Pennsylvania before 1855 and New Hampshire apparently before 1857 and the law of Massachusetts and Maine at the present day. And the few remaining jurisdictions where fetales survive, it appears that they descend according to the general laws governing interstate succession. Did y'all hear that, y'all? Did y'all hear that? No, y'all didn't hear me. Y'all did not hear me. All right, let's go here. Let's find another source. A less proportion of idle property, the Madison property rights, and the abolition of fee tail, i.e., primogeniture. All right, same topic.
This is from Washington and Lee Law Review. All right. This is a law review. By John F. Hart. Introduction. Everybody listen. The Virginia statute enacted in 1776 to abolish the fee tell estates and land forthrightly expressed a Republican conception of property rights. The preamble asserts the, per the perpetuation of property in certain families by means of gifts made to them in fee tell is contrary to good policy, tend to deceive fair traders who give a credit on the visible possession of estates. The scarce the holder thereof, thereof from taking care and improving the same, and sometimes does injury to the moral of youth by rendering them independent of any disobedient, rendering them independent of and disobedient to their parents. All right. The assembly. Accordingly, converted fee tellers. Yeah, to their parents. So it says the assembly converted fee teller state entails into fee simple estates, especially extinguishing the corresponding interest of the issue in tellers and those in reverse remandment. The statute thus transformed fee tell estates already in existence as well as the future tell estates. Now let's go back to fee tell. In this common law, fee tell or entail. Or uh, tell us I is a Scott in Scottish law is a form of trust established by a deed of settlement that restricts the settlement heritage of the state and real property and prevents the property from being sold, divided by will, or otherwise alienated by tenant and possession, instead causes to pass automatically by, automatically by operation of law. This type of uh, intel estate is contrast to fee simple. Okay? Contrast to fee simple. So it says the assembly accordingly converted fee tell estate intel into fee simple estates. Did y'all hear that? They converted it. Fee tell estates in colonial Virginia. All right. To evaluate the practical impact of the Act of 1776 and acted to abolish fee tail, it is necessary to assess the substance of Virginia's law of fee tail before 1776. Analysts must begin with a look at the English background. Fee tail or entail was a grant of land to A and to the heirs of its body. It was already in use before 1285 when Parliament enacted the statute that donors conditioned above responds to petition from landowners who wanted to bestow on a child in the heirs of his or her body an inheritable estate and land that could be that cannot be alienated and fee simple. The first tenant entail will hold the rough equivalent of a life estate. If she or she died with no heirs and no remainder lim limited to follow, the land would revert by operation of law to the grantor or the granted heir in fee simple. From 1280, from, from the year after 1285, it was uncertain how long fee tail restraints on alienation were effective. Uh, some thought the restraint on alienation was enforceable only against the first tenant entail. Others thought the restraint could be good for three generations or until the entry of a third heir entail. The view that the fee tail was potentially infinite in duration eventually prevailed over time, but this development was in turn largely eclipsed by another. English court permitted tenants entail to bar the fee the entail by using collusive legal processes that resulted in a common recovery. 
The proceeding properly orchestrated left the air intel, the reverse of an enemy manager with worthless causes of action against a nominal defendant sometime to a court crime while converting the tenant interest into fee simple. Collusive common recoveries have become so familiar over the years as to be considered a matter of right prior to English settlement in Virginia. Man, y'all better give me that for this. Y'all better give me that. So they converted your estate. Thomas Jefferson converted your estate in 1776. Let's go to the actual act. English Encyclopedia of Virginia. An act declaring tenants of land or slaves entitled to hold the same fee simple. Now, entitled is not entail or fee tail. That's the Scottish term. All right? The Scottish term is tell tell Let's look at it again. Fee tail. Let's just make sure we know what we're talking about, right? Everybody see this? In Scottish law, Telezy is a feudal concept of the inheritance of a movable property according to the arbitrary course that has been laid down, such as in the document known as a deed of Telezy. It was codified in the Intel Act of 1685. Telezy is similar to the common law concept of fee tail. It's not the same. As the heir and Telezy is entailed to the property. You hear that? As the heir and Telezy is entailed to the property. An heir and title lot could not sell the property so inherited, except to field superior, that is, to the holder of the dominion directum of the field. These are the alternative spellings, okay? This is it right here. Or this one. Let's just go back to the article, Encyclopedia. Listen to the language. Can you make this stuff up? An act declaring tenants of lands or slaves and tally to hold the same in fee simple. Okay? Right here. And an act declaring tenants of lands or slaves and tally to hold the same in fee temple. So you're not only talking about lands entail, but slaves entail to hold the same in fee simple past October 14, 1776, session of the General Assembly legislators abolished the feudal English property rule of entail, which protected the land from answering any debt accumulated by spendthrift offspring. Thomas Jefferson complained in his autobiography that the result of this is primogeniture or automatically passing inheritance to the elder son was the accumulation and perpetuation of wealth in select families. As part of his attempt at a comprehensive legal reform, he authorized this bill. You hear that? So he, how can this man change Intel Estates, which he has a surname as an heir, to fee simple? Why would he do such a thing? Why? I'm showing you why. It says, whereas the, the preparation of property in certain families by means of gifts made to them in fee tail is contrary to good policy. What policies? Their administrative policies. So therefore, it being enacted 
by the General Assembly of the Commonwealth of Virginia and is hereby enacted by the authority of the same that any person who now has or hereafter may have any estate in fee town, general or special, in any lands or slaves in possession or in the use or trust of any land or slave in possession or who now is or hereafter may be entitled to any such estate tell lies in reverse or remandment after the termination of the estate for life or lives or of any lesser state, whether such estate tell lies had been or should be created by deed, will, act of assembly, or by any other way or means, shall from henceforth or from the commencement of such estate tell lies stand if so facto see, meaning that it's soon to be factual in law until proven otherwise. It says, stand ipso facto seized, possessed or entitled of in or to such land or slave or use of land or slave, so held or to be held as the foresaid in possession, reversion, or remandment in full and absolutely simple in like manner, as if such deed, will, or act of assembly or other instrument had conveyed the same to him in fee simple. Any words, limitations, or conditions in this said deed, will, or act of assembly or other instrument to the contrary is notwithstanding. Saving to all and every person and person body politic incorporate other than the issue of intel and those in reversion and remandment, all such rights, title, and interest in the state claimed and demanded, as they, as they, every or any of them could or might claim. If this act had never been made in saving also to such issue intel and to those in reverse remandering any such rights or titles which they may have acquired by their own contract for good or valuable consideration actually in a bona fide pay and perform. Did you hear that? So that means that they're telling you that <coughs> these these saving them all these rights in regards to any person by politics or corporate in regards to provide a version management that incorporate under the those that were existing prior to the creation of the abolishing of the tenure acts that were of the uh of the what they call intel estate that were abolished under the acts that were created not just by what we call the commonwealth right because we know that library and season was abolished under charles the second yes library and season was abolished under charles the second Let's go back there. Season. In closing. Season. Tingers of subjects to season, varieties of season. Library or deed. All right. Library of deed. If it's not done by these two ways, then it falls on the primary season through inquisition post mortem. Okay? This is what all you fail to understand. This is the purpose of the crown. Okay, this is the whole intent and purpose of the crown. All right, let's see. Inquisition postmortem and Lario season. All right. Under the federal system of all land belonging to the monarch and was therefore either held by him directly under the royal demise or on his behalf directly or indirectly. Those who held land directly directly on the king's behalf were known as tenants in chief. When a tenant in chief died without an heir, his land exceeded to fell into the hands of the king. If there was an heir, the king kept the land until lottery of season took place. The heir paid a sum of money, a relief to take lawfully assumed possession of the land. 
If the heir was under age, the king kept the land until he or she came of age at 21 for men or 14 for women. And the king received the right of worship marriages, collecting the revenues of the estates and disposing of her in marriage. He was able to sell these rights to a third party who were not necessarily the ward's next kin. These Philistines and rights were abolished in the interregnum, reintroduced and then abolished in the following period of the government of the reign of Charles II in 1660 to 1685. This is the Commonwealth of England. All right. So you have to understand the purpose of lobby of season. When there is no heir, then it automatically ceases to the crown for one of an heir. All right. And let's go back. Let's go down on crown land. The crown and close. Concept. The concept of the crown to perform under the feudal system, though not, not used this way in all countries that had this system. In England, all rights under the privilege were ultimately bestowed by the ruler. Land, for instance, was granted by the crown to lords in exchange for the feudal services, and they, in turn, granted the land to lesser lords. Only exception to this was common soakage. Owners of the land held, held, at common, held as soakage held it subject only to the crown. When such land became ownerless, they are said to exceed, i.e., return direct ownership of the crown. Crown land. You hear that? Crown land is intel land, by which unowned property, primarily unclaimed inheritance, becomes the property of the crown. Going back to the Tenure Abolition Act. And all tenures here, hereafter to be created by the king, majesty, his heirs, or successors upon any gifts or grants of any manumous land, tenements, or inheritance of any state of inheritance at the common law should be free of common soakage and should be adjudged to be a free and common soakage only, and not to be night service or capitite, or to be discharged of all boards to values of forfeiture of marriage, library, primary, season, ousters, lemain, at per, fires, flits, chivalry, parts of, and any. Any law of statute reverse, reservation to the contrary thereof is not withstanding. In other words, this is the majority by statute. Tenures, honors, manners, lands, tenements, or inheritance of the state's inheritance at the common law either of the king, his majesty, or any person or body parts of the corporate at any time before July 4th. 1776 is declared to be an act concerning tenures past February 8th, 1795, is turned into free income and soakage from the time of the creation forever thereafter, and should continue to be held in free and common soakage, discharge of all federal tenures instances enumerated in that said section. There you have it there. So going back here and closing. I 
think I told you enough. Yes, no. So in closing, I just want you, brothers and sisters, who are heirs and successors of the English nation, to realize how important of the decisions you have to make in regards to being associated with the English church or the English nation or the English people, all right? This is a question that you all must ask yourself. Sometimes you, you either do it now or be forced to do it, okay? Once again, you either do it now or be forced to do it. And if you're forced to do it, it's not gonna be so good for you, all right? We all have an obligation, we all have an allegiance, well, we all have an obligation to honor our forefathers for who we descend down from. So take your pick. Who are your ancestors? Because if you're ancestors, that means you're an heir and you have an inheritance. The question on how you obtain that inheritance that only comes to the one who gave it to you, and that is the king. So with that, we're here at the third table in the Church of England. Say peace.